Welcome back to Morning Trade Live. It's time to get technical and talk some charts in the world of ETFs. Jenny Horn and Rick Ducat with me here in studio. Well, let's start with the winner here because uh, we're kind of kind of veer into the realm of decliners on the year, uh, but. Uh, we've got ARC, which uh, had a big percent gain on the year, 60%. We had the Hack ETF in the cloud group. We've been talking a little bit about kind of the pure tech. So let's start with Hack and the cybersecurity names, because a few of these companies did uh, kind of join the ranks of the greats. Absolutely. I mean, Palo Alto Networks has been yeah. one to watch all year long. That's exactly they're, what I had in mind. They're one of the largest holdings in, in this ETF. So I find that fascinating. And I think the rise we've seen in the interest in AI, of course, this year is also brought on a lot of cybersecurity concerns, naturally, because this technology is rapidly advancing, almost in an alarmingly pace. For then cybersecurity breaches, there's now a lot of gaps is what's seen. So this critical need is filled by name like, I mean, CrowdStrike and Checkpoint, Fortinet, Cisco, but Hack's biggest holdings, CrowdStrike, Zscaler, Splunk, Palo Alto Networks, and Cloudflare in that order, all roughly 6 to 5% of the overall index. And those names have seen stellar 2023s, to put it lightly. And all in all, I mean, this market is expected to continue to grow. Actually, per some research firms, they are expecting the global economy on cyber security specifically to rise to $10.5 trillion by what? just the end of the coming year. Years. So, I mean, oh, wow. that's massive. We've also seen just the global cybersecurity technology market rise by almost 12% year over year in the first half of 2023. So also seeing some strong growth this year. But what we know is from following some of these individual names that had breaches, I mean, MGM was one mm -hmm. where their website was down for days. Clorox. Clorox guided for now losses coming forward as a result of Crazy. they couldn't figure out their supply chain because of these cybersecurity hacks. T-Mobile, Microsoft X, also notable names that had wow. quietly but still yeah. substantially also breaches. So VFC, VFC, even shoes can get hacked. 10 trillion market cap. Rick, did you hear that? We need to stop playing video games and get our white hat <laughs> hacking skills together. If I had any brains, that's what I would have done. Me too. But, you know. Me too. So Say, say la vie, what can you do? That's why we but, look at lines on charts. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And you know what? There's some interesting lines on this one, too. <laughs> the first thing I did was uh, made a vertical line. You can see it's the start of the AI boom. It's when NVIDIA reported earnings on May 24th. Coincidentally, that lines up with the start of a, a long upward channel there in purple. So that, that kind of uh, seems like it kicked off things uh, be, for a lot of these names in this ETF. And you can see that our price action was kind of range bound for a while, for, for much of the first quarter of the year before that point. Then we transitioned. Uh, you can see another interesting thing on this chart was the peaks in the RSI, our, our measure of momentum there at the bottom of the screen. Between September to October, we saw some bearish divergence here. Price just kind of squeaked out some new closing highs. RSI actually trended down. We did get a drop off at that point. So that's an example of one thing you can look for in your trading. There was a good example of it in this mm. ETF. Then the trend accelerated to the upside. It got much steeper. The channel became much narrower too suggesting strength here. Um, you know, the steeper a move is, the less sustainable it is, but we're still, we're still looking uh, rather strong in this name here. RSI still overbought, still above that 70 line that, that um, denotes strength. If uh, you were to be trading this name and looking for potential support and resistance, standard deviation channels can help here. Our orange standard deviation line, that's our plus two line, comes in near 63, 65 or so. Support could be found near about 59.70 based on our plus one channel. Then we would have uh, our yellow 21 day EMA near about 58 or so for uh, one more line in the sand. We also had some clear volume nodes too. You can see on the, the blue bar graph on the right side of the screen, there's some clear areas of heavy trading. A as lot well. further down, yeah, right? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So we, we really went quickly to the upside here going into 2024 with the RSI hot burning up. I mean, you can't help but think some of this has uh, been supported by the change in the Fed's outlook because uh, to your point, Jenny, about the stocks in here, there are some huge winners, but the reason why the fund is basically in line with the cloud group as a whole and behind the NASDAQ is because it seems like some of the winners in the sector kind of eating lunch of the other players. Yeah, and that's a really good point, actually, because it, I mean, there are other substantial holdings that are like four, three percent that just I, I looked at the five largest and they sort of set the center stage, but that's right. not the entirety of the fund, obviously. Yeah. yeah, there's a lot of drag from kind of companies that get left behind. All right, now, uh, comeback stories and gains in tech. ARK K, Kathy Woods Fund, 
up uh, a little less than the NASDAQ, I think, by the end of the year, right? Like 50-something uh, percent. But uh, a lot of it from uh, uh, some of the extreme moves in a few handful of companies. Yeah, I mean, just to illustrate that, its largest holdings are Coinbase, which is over 10.5%. Yeah. which is a lot it, of it right there. Right, and that name has been on an absolute tear this year. And then as well as um, Roku, that's over 8% of the overall fund. That's been a consistent, really favorite of Kathy Wood. UiPath is almost 8%. And then Tesla is another major holding, which also saw a really stellar 2023. That's 7.5% sure. of the fund. But interesting to me was in November, they posted a 31% gain. That was the best wow. month since its inception in 2014. Wow. But what's a little bit concerning is what's yet to reappear with the same force are the flows. We actually saw it pull roughly $150 million in November, which pales in comparison to the often $1 billion they saw in flows during their pandemic sure. heyday. So, well, they're still so far off the highs. So far off the highs. And not to discount, I mean, it's nice to see this recovery as this is the best performing ETF we're looking at. But yep. I do think then it's important to look at context and say it's again like the recovery it's not necessarily just a pure play strength as far as its performance this year has gone even last year when the, the we all saw the funds price tumble almost 70 percent the investors still managed to dump a net of around 1.3 billion into the fund wow. so we haven't seen those flows come back yet but i think there's no surprise why we've seen this degree of strength when you have coinbase as 10 percent of your fund and that name is astronomical this year the thing that's uh, still so, I think, up for grabs in this is when they are portrayed as the future, uh, you know, tech fund, basically, the innovation, things that are going to happen over time, that the biggest winner is Coinbase and that whole asset class, Coinbase, Bitcoin and crypto, all still subdued off the records on a year where Apple broke through, NVIDIA broke through, the real AI trade. I mean, they basically had enough to keep up with it because they performed. But you would think if you're the futuristic innovation fund, when there's a massive new innovation of the year, you're going to have beta to that. And they didn't. They met the NASDAQ on a year where this massive new machine was basically unveiled. Uh, chart wise, Rick, technically, though, I mean, uh, over the year, the trend is very solid. Yeah, yeah, definitely trending up during the year. And one thing that stood out to me was that we found a bit of a bottom near 35. We, we laid down some, some support there. Uh, that was around where we hit lows multiple times our, on our chart here. And then you can see it's that light green uh, dashed line there. Um, then we, we made our way upward again. We hit some yearly highs around 50, 50 or so, 51 around that area. Then a downward channel. Uh, encompassed by those two blue dashed lines there uh, a bit of a slide but once again we found some support near that same level around 35 it looked like we were going to perhaps break below it for a little bit but then a, a, a meteoric rise to the upside very uh, a strong performance from that point. We can see as well that price crossed above all three of our moving averages that we typically follow in these segments. Yellow 21 day, orange 63 day, purple 252 day exponential moving averages. More weighted toward the recent price action, so that is a uh, a way to reduce some of the lag that's that's uh, found in these moving averages here. Uh, once again, a little bit of bearish divergence though. You can look at the RSI, you can see the pace of the gains has been slowing down recently. Repeated crossovers bouncing back and forth between uh, uh, around the overbought area, that 70 threshold. Now we're in a situation where we made some uh, a new closing high a couple days ago, and now we are uh, seeing that RSI could not keep up as well. So a potential warning sign coupled with a crossover below that 70 threshold, support near 50-50 based on our old highs. Once again, if we were to include standard deviation channels on this chart, the plus two channel, not too far above. It's near 54.30 or so. So uh, some potential resistance pretty close by, but you know, be on the lookout to see if we break to the downside through this channel. Yeah, the short-term momentum a little bit uh, slower, a little bit uh, weaker than the hack fund. Uh, you know, I have to say, I think maybe I gave this chart a little bit too much credit when I said obviously trending higher all year because it actually wasn't. I mean, it cut below a previous low right before it took off uh, in the fourth quarter. So, I mean, it was still kind of up for grabs. Uh, basically, I mean, I hate to say it, sorry, work team, but right before the, the Fed started signaling cuts, I mean, it seems like the macro shift was huge for this fund in the last couple months. It's, it's a noteworthy chart, though. We did still manage to get some strong gains out of it, but I see your point for yeah. sure. You know, it was looking- so How much was done in that last month and a half? 
Yeah. Right, 30 some percent November? 31 percent, right. All right, so as soon as the market basically <laughs> puts a cut in March, ARK goes ballistic. So it kind of, you know, it seems like so much of the crypto uh, stuff in it basically makes it this kind of like macro Fed bet in a way because you had this big tech innovation and it kept up with the NASDAQ. So it would have been just as good getting all the innovation by buying the NASDAQ. Well, and um, is it like a spot Bitcoin ETF bet at this point? Because that's where a lot of this that, enthusiasm came sure, from. Yeah, yeah, maybe. Fair enough, which I feel like is like weird because like Coinbase, you know, people were buying Coinbase for the, e like on the ETF stuff, but like mm -hmm. I'm not sure if it's great for Coinbase. All right. Uh, now, you'd be very uh, distraught though if you were in our next fund. Let's talk the solar stuff. Uh, did the future come and go with solar already, Jenny? Okay, so you would be distraught if you looked at just this year in 2023. We've right? obviously underperformed the overall market but actually if you look at the last five years this index has still outperformed the S&P 500 sizably which is up over a hundred percent over the last five years ah, which I okay. think speaks All to right. the volatile nature of okay. the, the solar industry frankly I mean it's like we, the reverse arc for the year it did terrible on the year but it still is you know Exactly. And I think, over the last five. I oh. think that's really interesting. I mean, I think that solar stocks have been some of the most fascinating stories to watch because we've seen the stark divergence in the ways these companies operate because we call them all solar stocks, but frankly, they benefit from different trends. First, solar was the standout, closing the year in green territory pretty firmly, while other names, I mean, hemorrhaged on the year, like Solar Edge, Sun Run, just unable to catch any sort of love from investors. But all in all, what the one of the major issues was collectively for the space was that it was expected we'd see some slowdown in spending in the solar industry in the U.S., but then we started to hear the same sentiment echoed in Europe, particularly in nations like Germany, which was not expected. So not only are we seeing weakness here, we're seeing it overseas, and that led to some of this, this downside. But mm. the solar industry, while it's facing challenges and some skepticism, some believe it can only really survive with these significant government subsidies. The U.S. Energy Information Administration believes solar power will account for most of the nation's capacity in terms of power production by 2050. So it's like, this is going to be a longer term story because right now the overall market is around 15% as far as like wind, solar collectively. So some see this as a massive addressable market, but again, it's a volatile ride, of course. Mm, yeah, and uh, government support was basically the time to sell, uh, you know, a year right. prior, uh, which was uh, fascinating. I do wonder maybe what role crude oil played in here especially when I think about kind of the international slowdown and some of the solar stuff because there was like this energy crisis a year and a half ago and then all those prices dropped. So that like strong feeling of uh, in imminent immediate need for alternative energy and you know, when crude oil drops like it does, it kind of lessens some of that uh, race a bit. Technically, Rick, uh, is there hope that the last month put a low in or what do you think? I think there is hope, you know, uh, and, you know, things really got went from kind of not great to worse when when we crossed below that threshold near about 67. Uh, we had a gap down uh, in late July here. So uh, that was kind of when things really started to accelerate to the downside here. You can see we have a long term trend in dark blue, a shorter term downtrend in the light blue color, the more cyan color, I guess you could call it. But since then, we've broken through that downtrend. We put in yearly lows. We saw bullish divergence on the RSI. Price made a new closing low. RSI was trending upward here. Complicated a little bit by the fact that we were in the oversold area bouncing back and forth once again, but trending upward. You can see we've got that green line on the RSI. RSI has crossed above the 50 midline. Price has moved above our two shorter term moving averages, yellow 21 day, orange 63 day. The moving averages starting to trend upward, suggesting that the trend is improving and picking up some steam toward the, downs, uh, to, toward the upside there. 54, that red dashed line, that would be one area to look Look out for. We had a small gap there that was about where we had some uh, some consolidation as well. That's also a low point in our volume profile er mm. uh, area. Okay. That's an area of relatively thin trading. So we could see fast moving prices if we get beyond that area. But to the upside, that's the point to clear. Then our 252 day exponential moving average comes in near 60.75 and then a uh, the gap that I mentioned before, uh, near 67, we hit some highs after that near roughly 65 or so. So that would be another point to watch. But uh, support confluence near a, uh, the area, near about uh, 48.50 or so, based on our two moving average coalescing uh, right on top of each other and a uh, high point and then a post-gap low point as well, all coming together in the same point. The 
hard work seems to have been put in here to get that low and to trend higher on the RSI was a, a big development for this stock at the end of the year, or this ETF rather. So uh, maybe a easier road ahead if it can punch through some of those uh, kind of weaker areas of resistance with low volume and stuff. Uh, nice look at the chart, appreciate it. Great look at the analysis. Jenny Horn and Rick Ducat.